William Cyrongeur, a revolutionary statesman, a man who joined his fate with the destiny of his nation. In 1915, at Gallipoli, he handed the British one of the most devastating defeats in their history. In 1918, he emerged from World War I as the only undefeated Ottoman commander. Four years later, he led his people in their struggle against the invading Greek forces and won back their independence. In 1923, on the ruins of the defunct Ottoman Empire, he founded and became the first president of the Republic of Turkey. Six months later, he became the first leader to attack and defeat Islamic theocracy. With the seeds of democracy he planted, the nation he cultivated, endured tribulations both from inside and outside for decades. Stalin considered him a fascist. Hitler and Mussolini said he was a communist. Others called him a dictator. His people called him Ataturk, Father Turk. Ottoman Empire. This multinational, multilingual dynasty, for centuries the most glorious, most feared empire of the world. At its height, under the rule of the world famous Solomon the Magnificent in the 16th century, the empire encompassed southern Europe, Arabia, near Asia, North Africa, threatening the gates of Vienna. By late 19th century, the glorious days of the Ottomans were distant memories of the past. Lagging behind the progress in the rest of the world, the empire was ridiculed by the Western powers as the sick man of Europe. After an unsuccessful attempt at constitutional democracy in 1876, the Ottoman Empire became more autocratic and theocratic under the rule of Abdul Hamid II, Caliph and Sultan. Caliph, the head of the Muslim world, Sultan, head of state. Reacting to the intrusions of the Western powers into the empire's internal affairs, he turned the country into a police state and ruled with merciless authority for 33 years. However, even his despotic rule could not prevent the ideas of nationalism and democracy so active in the Balkans from entering the young minds of his subject soldiers. Into this theocratic and despotic rule, rising tide of nationalism and internal unrest, Ataturk was born as an Ottoman. He would die a Turk. Salonika, the largest, most important port city of the Ottoman Empire in Europe. A crucial extension of the empire, its multi-ethnic structure was composed of Jews, Turks, Greeks, Armenians, and other Balkan Christians. Zubeda Hanim and her customs clerk husband, Ali Riza Efendi, lived in the Turkish region of this cosmopolitan city. In 1881, after the deaths of all three previous children, they experienced the birth of a son. Mustafa Kemal Ataturk was born into a house of mourning house of death. Mother was young and that she had had uh, children before he was born and the children had died and he was uh, what in psychological terms would be called a replacement child. And in being a replacement child he was extremely special, very special to his mother, very special uh, role in the family. In one way he held on being special. He held on being immortal. He held on being a repair. This aspect of him was true. It was a reality for him because his mother perceived him as such. And since he was extremely bright, he added his own intelligence and brightness and so on. So he developed a nucleus of, of being a, a, a repairer, omnipotent person or future omnipotent person. The second major event uh, outside of early mother-child relationship was uh, the father's death and before his death giving his son a, a gift. His mother, who was 
a much more religious person uh, who uh, was known sort of as a mullah, that she could always discourse on religious themes, uh, wanted him to go to the local uh, school in the mosque and perhaps follow a religious career and become an alim or a qadi or something like that. Uh, she wanted that very much. Uh, his father wanted him to go to a newly opened Western school, Shemsuddin, Shemsi Effendi School. And uh, so they enrolled him, his father enrolled him, with, along with his mother, for the first day in the local religious school, and then took him out and put him in the Western school. Mustafa's father changed not only the destiny of his son, but also that of the Turkish nation. Seeing the difference between religious education, which chained all free thought, and the Western school, which encouraged freedom and equality, Mustafa came to value modern education and intellectual freedom. After hardships and stints in other schools following his father's death, Mustafa, despite his mother's opposition, entered the exams for the military school in Salonika in 1893 and passed. He uh, always wanted to wear a uniform which is one of the things that enticed him to go to, med to, go to uh, military school. And uh, he struck quite a handsome figure in his uh, uniforms, which uh, did a lot for his own self-esteem and helping him to develop a sense of who he was. After two years in the Salonika Secondary School, Mustafa, now referred to as Mustafa Kamal, was admitted to the Monastir Military Training School in 1895. His first time away from home, Monastir made him aware of the larger situation outside of the school and in the European section of the empire. Young Mustafa Kemal was exposed to ethnic diversity. He was exposed to ideas of nationalism. He was exposed to Western and Jewish cultures. At school, he made friends who introduced him to poetry and the banned works of famous French philosophers. He began to devour Rousseau, Voltaire, Montesquieu, and the patriotic Turkish poet Namik Kamal, very often into the early hours of the morning and in secret. The young Mustafa Kamal began to think of realistic solutions for the problems of the empire. He was becoming more and more concerned with the despotic condition of the country and its future. Foreign agents, fueled and guided by the great powers, were provoking the minorities against the empire. In 1897, tension over the island of Crete culminated in a war between the Greeks and the Turks. Seeing the mobilized troops march to the front, Mustafa Kemal could not stop nationalist and patriotic feelings from boiling inside him. Two years later, Mustafa Kemal graduated to the Imperial War College in Istanbul. He was ready for the legendary Ottoman capital. The heart of the empire, Istanbul was divided between the primitive region inhabited by the poverty-stricken Turks and Pera, where the rich foreigners and the minorities lived. Controlling the empire's economy and internal affairs, the foreigners had formed an untouchable dominion, while the Turks were forced to live like prisoners within their own land. No criticisms of the sultan or the government were allowed. Corruption was rampant, friend would turn against friend, brother would turn against brother to get a lucrative position in the government. The Imperial War College was no exception. Overcrowded by thousands, lacking sanitation, and crawling with the spies of the Sultan, the pathetic conditions of the school overwhelmed the cadets. Students were even forced to pray five times a day in the name of the Sultan and Caliph. In 1899, Mustafa Kemal started his studies as a cadet of the infantry class. It was a new environment for him. He had no friends at the beginning, and uh, he lapsed into periods of depression, uh, which he came out of easily once he made some friends, and among those friends, of course, was Ali Fuat Jebusoy. And he was welcomed into the homes of his friends. Many of his friends had high fathers who were high-ranking military officers, and so Kamal uh, began to be known to these people, uh, and uh, he uh, began to enjoy his life much more in Istanbul. Defying the Sultan's strict orders banning the officers to drink in public while in uniform, 
Mustafa Kamal and Ali Fouad frequented the bars and cafes and sampled the European lifestyle in the Pera region. Under the increasing despotism of the Sultan, Mustafa Kemal despised tyranny and became more concerned with freedom and the ways to achieve it. He immersed himself in his military courses to find solutions pertinent to the empire's problems. When Mustafa Kemal and Ali Fouad were cadets at the War College, they secretly published some papers to do with the uh, situation, the pathetic situation of the Ottoman Empire. He began to dominate his circle with his ideas on the future of the empire. Mustafa Kemal was becoming more political. He was also becoming more ambitious. He viewed himself as the savior of the country. He and his friends would sit around in the cafes and uh, Kemal would uh, tell them about what would happen in their future and he would organize the government and they would all have ministries, but he would be the head man. After graduating from the Staff College in 1905, Captain Mustafa Kamal was imprisoned temporarily for publishing illegal papers. A marked soldier, he was exiled to Damascus. It was the beginning of a career filled with hardships and struggles in the near future, but with illustrious victories in the distant. He was 24. During his three-year exile in Damascus, Mustafa Kamal witnessed corruption within the army, resentment in the subjects of the empire, and above all, he realized how radical Islam, which ruled their lives, enslaved them and blocked all progress. He was a loner in Damascus, battling with depression and insomnia due to the pathetic situation that engulfed him. He realized that change could not be achieved by force alone. It had to be methodical, well-founded. Reading incessantly, his knowledge reached such a level that he remarked, Among all the philosophers whom I have studied till now, I did not come across anyone who has offered realistic solutions for the welfare of mankind. To prepare other officers and the people, he and his friends formed a secret organization named Motherland and Freedom, their motto being, Where there is no freedom, there is death and extinction. Freedom is the only solution. Acting before Mustafa Kemal, the Committee of Union and Progress, another secret organization whose members included many officers of the army, revolted against the Sultan in 1908 and restored the constitution he had abolished 31 years before. Having been forced to merge his organization with that of the committee, Mustafa Kamal had only a sideline seat in this historic event, which has come to be known as the Young Turk Revolution. Following the revolution, Kamal insisted that the Balkan possessions of the empire were in imminent danger. The empire had to abandon its lands in Europe and retreat to a more compact, more easily defensible land in Anatolia. Ridiculed by the leaders of the committee, this idea in 11 years would be known as the National Pact. In 15 years, it would become the Turkish Republic. A year later, the Sultan staged a counter-revolution to overthrow the liberal democracy established by the Young Turks. Mustafa Kemal was appointed as the staff officer of the army, marching into Istanbul to suppress the counter-revolution. Naming it Army of Action, the two telegrams he sent to the general staff contained such terms as nation and the will of the nation. Unprecedented in official correspondence till that day, they foreshadowed his plans for a future government. Overthrowing the Sultan and appointing a new puppet, Sultan Khalif, the committee held its first annual congress, where Mustafa Kamal made his first political speech. Criticizing the party, he insisted that the military should withdraw from politics and that religion and state affairs should be separated. This, and his further criticism of the party in the cafes and bars of Salonika, led to the severance of his ties with the committee. He was once again a marked soldier this time by a different government. He lost out in a power struggle among young officers. He was extremely ambitious, 
but his main rival, Enver, who then became Enver Pasha, was more dashing, even more ambitious, and the two were in constant competition from the 1908 Young Turkish Revolution onwards. Enver Pasha uh, would always uh, seek to find ways to keep Mustafa Kemal's career from developing uh, in a more forward direction. Immersing himself in his career, he wrote and translated military books and began to devise strategies for the empire's defense against an attack from the Balkans, which, with the growing appetites of the newly formed nations, seemed highly probable. His reputation began to spread as a highly competent military strategist and field commander after his services in Salonika, Picardy, and Tripoli. Ataturk was a brilliant soldier. He was able to appeal to the common soldier, but he did not get along with his senior officers because when he felt they were wrong, he told them so. As a result of that, the senior people in the army constantly wanted to get Mustafa Kemal as far away from them as they could. After their defeats in the Tripolitanian and Balkan Wars, the empire lost most of its possessions in Europe and North Africa. Capitalizing on the situation, three members of the committee, Enver, Jemal, and Talat, established a triumvirate which would rule the country with an iron fist for the next six years. The committee, which came to power with promises of overthrowing tyranny, itself became a dictatorial oligarchy with Enver in the lead. After his ongoing criticism of the party and Enver, Mustafa Kemal was posted as military attaché to Sofia. While he was there, he was the darling of the diplomatic community in Sofia. Handsome man, he was always willing to cut a figure. There was a party and Kemal sent to Istanbul for a Janissary uniform, uh, which created quite a stir in Sofia society. Although he enjoyed the social scene of Bulgaria, Mustafa Kemal was disillusioned with the situation of his career. Enver had risen through the ranks and had become a general and minister of war, while he remained only a lieutenant colonel. With the rising conflict in Europe, Kemal was aware of the approaching world war. Britain's negligence and refusal to cooperate with the young Turks, coupled with the infiltration of the Ottoman army by the German military mission, created a rapprochement between the puppet sultan and the German Kaiser, Wilhelm II. Not respecting the Germans or their military skills, Gustav Kemmel, without success, insisted on staying neutral. For many years, he had been waiting for his moment to come. World War I would give it to him. Despite Mustafa Kemal's warnings, the Ottoman Empire entered the war on the side of Germany and the Austro-Hungarian Empire against the Triple Entente of Great Britain, Russia and France. After the standstill in the 350-mile Western Front and the realization that this was to be a long and arduous war, all eyes turned to the East. The Russians at the end of December 1914 uh, were under great pressure in the Caucasus and they sent a message asking the French and the British if they could do something to help draw Turkish forces away from the Caucasus and this was the final catalyst in precipitating what became the Dardanelles and ultimately the Gallipoli campaign. With the strong lobbying of Winston Churchill on February the 5th 1915 the British War Committee ordered an attack to force the Dardanelles and capture Istanbul. Only three days before, Lieutenant Colonel Mustafa Kemal was posted to the Gallipoli Peninsula in command of the 19th Division. An event going unnoticed at the time was to change the outcome of the whole campaign. Just a few miles from the ancient city of Troy lay the Straits of Dardanelles and the Gallipoli Peninsula, which had witnessed the legends of Alexander the Great and Jason and the Argonauts. 
The straits linked the Aegean to Istanbul, which was connected to Tsarist Russia by the Bosphorus. The historical question of Napoleon remained, who will hold Istanbul? February the 19th, assembling the greatest naval armada witnessed by the Mediterranean, the Allies began their attack on the Dardanelles. Confronted by heavy counterfire from the Turkish forts and mobile guns, the Allies withdrew. After consecutive unsuccessful attacks on February the 25th and in the first week of March, the Allies postponed the operation. Winston Churchill, growing impatient with the resistance, gave orders for a full-scale naval strike. March the 18th. Progressing towards the Straits in three lines, the Allies began a heavy bombardment of the Turkish shores. Just when the ships seemed headed for a breakthrough, Disaster struck. Under heavy bombardment from the Turkish forts, the French Bouvet and the British Irresistible and Ocean hit the mines laid by a Turkish ship named Luzrat and sank. At the end of the battle, three ships had been sunk while three others were put out of commission. In return, nothing was achieved. The great, formidable British Navy had suffered an astonishing defeat at the hands of the sick man of Europe. After the British attempt to force an arrows was set back on the 18th of March, both the naval commander, Admiral John de Robeck, and the military commander, General Sir Ian Hamilton, realised that it would be necessary to make a landing to clear the European shore of the peninsula before the Navy could resume the attempt to sweep the arrows. Hamilton and his staff immediately began to devise plans for what was to be the greatest, most ambitious, amphibious operation in world history until Normandy in World War II. After a month of careful planning, the Allies, under the protection of their naval bombardment, landed at Gallipoli on the morning of April the 25th. Australian and New Zealand troops, known as the Anzacs, landed at Aribuanu, today called Anzac Cove. Not encountering any significant Turkish resistance, the Anzacs proceeded inward, up Chunik Bear. Mustafa Kemal realised from the very first moment that the key to defending the whole of the Garba Tepe position would be the hills which culminated around Kochuk Kemin Tepe and Chunuk Bear. And he knew this before he set out and set out with this knowledge that it was going to be absolutely essential that this particular position should be denied to the invading forces. When Mustafa Kemal arrived um, at Kojuk Kimintepi, he could see very little um, except the British ships out to shore. So he left the men that had come with him and moved down the hills towards Chanuk Bear, where he found the small number of defenders moving back from the advancing Australians. He took the defenders of the Turkish forces and he said to them, you must turn and fight. And despite the fact that they complained they had no ammunition, he made them stop, put on their bayonets, lie down. And that in itself was enough to arrest the Australian movement northward up the hills. While the Anzacs hesitated, Mustafa Kamal's troops reached the area and he engaged them in action with himself fighting in the forefront. his chance to be the saviour of his country had finally come. He would either prove to the world who Mustafa Kamal was, 
or would die trying. His fighting with fanaticism and readiness to die made his soldiers die on his orders. I don't order you to fight. I order you to die. In the time it takes us to die, other troops can come and take our places. At the end of the day of fierce fighting and bravery on both sides, the Anzac advance had been stopped and Chunuk Bear secured. The way that he managed to keep it within Turkish hands on the 25th of April as it was in fact a defining moment of what took place at Anzac. Becoming a full colonel in June, Mustafa Kamal was put in command of the whole Northern Front in August. He led a successful attack against the British and stopped their advance in the Suvla region further north. On the morning of August the 10th, during his decisive attack against the Anzacs, an event took place that was to change Mustafa Kemal forever. In the course of the battle, shrapnel shell exploded and he was hit with a piece of shrapnel above the heart. But fortunately, the shrapnel lodged in his watch, which he had in his press pocket, and so he was not seriously wounded. After this event in Gallipoli, there occurred a fit between internal belief that he was immortal and external event proving that he was immortal. And so he, he became more cohesive internally so that he could do what he did later on with more ease. Following that day, he walked freely in trenches under heavy fire creating a legend for himself among his troops. After Mustafa Kamal's charges on August the 9th and 10th, not a single strategic hill was in Allied hands. The mighty British Empire had been defeated at Gallipoli. Winston Churchill lost his position as First Lord of the Admiralty. Mustafa Kamal's reputation spread among his colleagues and the people. British official history states Seldom in history can the exertions of a single divisional commander have exercised on three different occasions so profound an influence not only on the course of a battle, but perhaps on the fate of a campaign, even the destiny of a nation. He demonstrated both on the 25th of April and again in August that he had a driving ruthlessness which the British commanders often lacked. They weren't prepared to drive their men as hard as he was. He acted with decision and vigour and prevented the potential of an attack from opening out. And I think at those three points, you could say he managed to turn the tide of those particular battles. And in that way, through doing it three times, he would emerge as the leading character from the whole campaign. Mustafa Kemal came to Gallipoli, an outcast by his government, and left as a national hero. Unfortunately, the Ottoman victory at Gallipoli could not prevent the inevitable. The situation of the Ottoman Empire and her allies deteriorated rapidly. Defeat seemed certain. The Entente powers had already started to make plans to splice the empire, with Italy, France, England and Greece all hoping and waiting for a share of the spoils. After his service at Gallipoli, Mustafa Kamal was promoted to general. Battling with malaria that he had contracted in Tripoli, he continued to fight as an army commander in the east against the Russians and in the southeast against Allenby's British forces. He not only gained invaluable experience in many different corners of the country, but also started to form more compact ideas for the future. October the 30th, 1918. The Ottoman Empire with a new Sultan, Vatedin, surrendered to the British at the island of Madras. The Allies immediately began to occupy different regions of the country. The same day that the Allied fleet sailed into the Bosphorus, 
Mustafa Kemal returned to Istanbul. He was the only Ottoman commander that never suffered a defeat during World War I. And it, it was as a result of that that he had a tremendous reputation among the mass of the people. He added to that reputation because as soon as the armistice was signed, he openly and vociferously declared that it was unfair to the Turks and should never have been signed. Looking at the anchored enemy ships and feeling disgraced, he said, as they have come, so shall they go. The Turkish struggle for independence had started. The entrance of the Allies into Istanbul was celebrated enthusiastically by the Greek and Armenian minorities of the city. With the cooperation of the Sultan, the British immediately took control of the capital. Flags of the occupational forces were everywhere. Crime was rampant and the future of the country was uncertain. In a few months, as the invaders signed new agreements amongst themselves, it became clear to Mustafa Kemal and his friends that the Allies not only sought to occupy the country, but also intended to dismember it among themselves. The only glimmer of hope for the Turks were the independent resistance groups, known collectively as the Defense of Rights Association, which opposed the occupations in their isolated regions. Realizing that the situation in Istanbul was hopeless, Mustafa Kemal began to look for other alternatives for the salvation of the country. Winning the support of Hussein Rauf, the naval hero of the Balkan Wars, along with Kiazim and Ali Fouad, the commanders of the only remaining military forces, he decided that the salvation lay in Anatolia. Anatolia was largely Turkish at this time. And he felt that if the Turks were going to resist the Allies, it had to be from the heartland of the Turkish people, namely in Anatolia, that this resistance could be organized. Under pressure from the British, the Sultan sought a commander who would supervise the surrender of the remaining Turkish troops in Anatolia. Mustafa Kemal volunteered for the job. The Sultan trusted Mustafa Kemal. Mustafa Kemal did not trust the Sultan, but he was close to the Sultan, and he made use of his relationship with the Sultan in order to secure the kind of command which he needed to lead the Turkish National Resistance Movement. Having been bestowed with great authority, he could command the two army corps in Anatolia and give orders to the mayors of five provinces. It would not be long before the Sultan and the British regretted disappointment. As Mustafa Kemal made preparations to embark on his journey, British Prime Minister Lloyd George authorized and supported a Greek landing on the western coast of the country at Izmir on May the 15th, 1919. The Greeks, in secret consultation with Lloyd George, agreed that this would not be temporary but would be a permanent occupation. And to make sure of this, when they landed at Izmir, Instead of simply taking nominal control, they began large-scale massacres of the Turks and the Jews who lived there in order to encourage them and also the Turks and Jews living elsewhere in western Anatolia to flee as they did. Four days after the Greek landing, Mustafa Kemal landed on the Black Sea coast of the country the fight for Anatolia had begun. From then on, it is impossible to uh, do anything but consider the life of Mustafa Kemal Ataturk and the life of Turkey bound together. And what happens up until his death and even afterwards uh, stems from that moment. The Turks were in a very difficult position. The Greeks had occupied all of Thrace and southwestern Anatolia. The Italians had occupied southern Anatolia. The French had occupied southeastern Anatolia, so-called Cilicia, as well as Syria, and uh, others had occupied northeastern Anatolia. At the same time, the British had maintained a blockade of Anatolia, which resulted that no food could be imported from outside, while at the same time, agriculture in Anatolia was almost at a standstill and there was no transportation. With the result, there was no food, no fuel, no clothing, people were starving, People were dying as a result of famine. 
given the circumstances under which they had to operate and the challenges they were facing, and I know of no other military leader that faced such formidable challenges as that occurred. After all the years of war and negligence by the central government, the Turkish people, whom Mustafa Kemal was now to turn to, were worn out and depleted. He had to shake and awaken the people, who had always considered themselves the subject of the Sultan, from centuries of lethargy and forced them to seize their own destiny. He knew that for his movement to succeed and be permanent, he had to create a struggle that was initiated and supported by the people. Everything had to be legitimate and ideologically well-founded. A revolutionary idea at the time, it was announced to the whole country from the city of Amasya. Signed by Mustafa Kemal, Ali Fouad, and Rauf, and other commanders, it became known as the Amasya Declaration. The Declaration of Amasya is the foundation stone of the Turkish War of Independence. The nation must save itself by its own willpower. That was his slogan, that was his motto. The struggle would need a leader of immense dedication, unprecedented effort and concentration. His friends decided that Mustafa Kemal alone had the qualifications. These patriotic officers put the national interest before their personal interests and their personal ambitions. They were all ambitious men, but they decided at that point that to make a success of the Turkish national resistance movement, they needed Mustafa Kemal as leader. Not only was he the best leader, he was the only leader who could make a success of the struggle. The Amasya Declaration also announced the forthcoming congresses at Sivas and Azgarum. Under the leadership of Mustafa Kamal, secretly elected representatives from villages and towns around the country decided that the struggle had to be brought to a national plane and fought with a regular army. All suggestions of foreign intervention were refused. With an opposition forming against him in Sivas, the congresses were strenuous for Mustafa Kamal. Many people, questioning his ambitions and private life, doubted his political leadership. Others were weary that the struggle was becoming too personalized under his name. In addition, the Istanbul government, growing suspicious, had ordered his return. Viewed as a rebel general by the Sultan and the British, he was forced to resign from the military. Stripped of his official title, Mustafa Kemal was now a civilian, an ex-general without an army. His old friend, Ali Fouad, had been ordered to arrest Kemal. In rebellion, he refused. Now Kiazim, the commander of the largest military force in Anatolia, received the same order. This is a crucial turning point in the history of Turkey and the history of Mustafa Kemal. Uh, Qasim Karabakir could have arrested him, uh, could have uh, done many things, but instead he says to him, Buyrun Pasham. Uh, here you are, you have my troops at your disposal. And from that moment on uh, is really the beginning of the War of Independence. Gaining Kiazm's support, Mustafa Kemal decided to set the seat of the provincial government and open a parliament in Ankara. While Mustafa Kemal was busy organizing a regular army and establishing the principles of their struggle, the Greeks were advancing further east towards Ankara. As Mustafa Kemal withdrew the national forces, which means the local guerrilla forces, back to Ankara in order to organize them into a regular organized army, there were many people in the Grand National Assembly who criticized Mustafa Kemal on the grounds that he was being defeated, that the Turks were losing their nation, and that instead of withdrawing forces, he should stand and fight. Things looked very bleak for Mustafa Kemal. The Sultan sent an army of sorts to fight the nationalists, 
There were rebellions and mutinies all over Anatolia in response to the Sultan's call to kill Mustafa Kemal. Mustafa Kemal drew strength from hopelessness and despair. His determination, self-confidence and will for freedom since childhood enabled him to work restlessly and with great vigor. Spending endless hours at the parliament, he explained the situation and his goals to the deputies. Freedom and independence are my character. I put it as the main condition that my country should have the same characteristics. In order for me to live, I should be the child of a free nation. Thus, the national sovereignty is a matter of life for me. He went on, together with his comrades, to organize an army that would stop the Greek advance. Two incidents, one personal, the other political, were to affect the course of his life. A woman with whom he had become intimate in Istanbul could not endure their separation and had decided to join him in his struggle. She was a very traditional Muslim girl who falls in love with her hero, comes to Ankara and functions as his wife and woman and makes a home for him. Fikriya adored Mustafa Kemal and he enjoyed being the center of her affection. People in Ankara had begun to notice this beautiful woman who occasionally rode a horse and accompanied Mustafa Kemal. Although not married, they seemed like the perfect couple, or so thought Fikriya. Time would tell what Mustafa Kemal thought. In the political arena, the Allies forced the Istanbul government to sign the Treaty of Save on August 10th, 1920. The result was a treaty which, if carried out, would have given the Turks independence in a small part of central Anatolia, would have left the rest of Anatolia, containing primarily Turks, either under control of the Allied powers or under the control of an Armenian and a Greek and Kurdish states. Mustafa Kemal knew that the time had come to rally the people and carry the struggle to victory. He and his friends acted with swiftness and finesse, which would prevent the Allies from reacting to the very end. He foresaw the way that battle could be won. It could be won basically by a combination of toughness of the Allies and creating divisions among them. He managed to create divisions with the British and the French to make certain that the great powers did not take any military action against them. Securing the political situation, Mustafa Kemal ordered Kiazim to capture eastern Turkish towns from the recently formed Armenian state. And by defeating the Armenians, Mustafa Kemal re-established Turkey's traditional eastern borders. With the east secured, he could now turn west to the rapidly advancing Greeks, who along with Lloyd George, still did not consider him and the nationalists a serious threat. Lloyd George himself, a few British politicians around him, felt that Mustafa Kemal was a wretch, a bandit, a rebel of the worst sort. Mustafa Kemal was once again under attack in the parliament. The Greeks had captured Eskishia and were approaching Ankara. But he knew that the Greeks, by penetrating too much into Anatolia, had traveled too far from their headquarters at Izmir. He said very clearly, the moment we stop the Greeks anywhere in Anatolia, they're lost. Because once they're stuck, they didn't have the staying power to continue the war forever, particularly if Allied support for them was chipped away gradually, which Mustafa Kemal proceeded to do with great skill. Mustafa Kemal needed unconditional support from everyone. He had to act fast and act without being questioned. Taking advantage of the Greeks' proximity to Ankara, he convinced the parliament to grant him extraordinary powers. 
Referred to as the Supreme Commander, he went about organizing and equipping the Turkish army with unprecedented energy and ruthlessness. I had to interest the Turkish nation in the war in all their actions, their sentiments, and their conceptions. Every single individual in the village, in his home, in the fields, had to consider himself in the same way as those fighting at the front. He not only could fight the army and command it, but he had to build it. And he had to get some acceptance from the Turkish people, and he had to generate resources, and he had to design equipment, and he had to train the entire organization from scratch. That's really, in my judgment, a tremendous accomplishment. Following Mustafa Kemal, every Turk rallied his last for him and for their independence. After the Greek armies advanced to within 51 kilometers of Ankara, everything rested in the fight that would take place on the banks of the river Sakaria. Mustafa Kemal was there to personally command his troops. You will no longer have a line of defense, but you will have a surface of defense. Retiring groups will halt when they can, but the whole line will not retire to form a new front. All of Turkey shall be our surface of defense. He also promised execution to anyone who retreated without his specific orders. Under Mustafa Kemal's leadership, Turks were ready to make their stand. After 22 days and nights of fierce fighting, the Greek advance had finally been stopped. The stand was so successful that not only did the Greeks pull back from the Sakaria, but they never again tried to reach the Sakaria. Instead, they fell back in disorder and never again were a serious threat to the national movement. Mustafa Kemal was given the title of Marshal by the Parliament. His reputation not only spread within the country, but also in the East, among the colonies of the British Empire. Within two years of his arrival in Anatolia, Mustafa Akmal was able to open a parliament, recapture Turkish territories in the east and the south, break the unity of the Allies, and isolate the Greeks. He felt stronger and more confident than ever. What remained was the last blow against the Greeks and their British sponsors. The rebel was about to become the savior he had always dreamed of. As Mustafa Kemal prepared for his decisive attack against the Greeks, his life, as well as the city of Ankara, were changing. The newly formed Soviet Union had opened an embassy in the city, while many other government buildings were also being erected. Fikri, with her unshakable devotion for Mustafa Kemal, made a warm home life for him while many people joined him nightly to discuss his plans for the future of the country. Once after dinner, when Fikri asked him about marriage, he replied, I am married to the Turkish nation. After a year of careful planning and total secrecy, Mustafa Kemal decided that the morning of August the 26th would be the day of judgment. Surprising his commanders, he decided to attack the Greeks at their strong point of Afium, described as impregnable by British engineers. Gathering his troops in secret and devising some false maneuvers to mislead the enemy, he prepared for battle. On the morning of August the 26th, viewing the front from Kojatepe Hill, he ordered the attack.
victory was immediate. With a swift, ferocious attack by the Turkish army, the Greeks were taken by total surprise. Within three days, the Greek commanders had been captured and the Turkish troops were on their way to liberate Izmir, where the Greeks had landed three years before. Leading his troops and exuding a wave of energy and confidence, Mustafa Kemal, by August the 31st, had erased the Greeks' mega idea, which had envisioned the re-establishment of the Byzantine Empire. In relentless pursuit of the retreating Greek army, Turkish troops entered Izmir on September the 9th, 1922. After the re-entry of Turkish troops into Izmir, Lloyd George fell from power and politically the British establishment had started revising its plans for the Near East, returning to the traditional idea that Turkey and not Greece was the strong regional power. In Greece, of course, a disaster, a revolution. The generals and the prime minister shot eventually the fall of the monarchy. Acknowledged as the saviour, Mustafa Kemal was the most powerful, most revered man in the country. He was offered the positions of Sultan and Caliph to sit at the throne of the Ottoman dynasty. But he had other plans in mind. Mustafa Kemal had already decided to abolish the Sultanate the first chance he got. Again, the Allies would provide the opportunity. They invited both the Sultan's government in Istanbul and the Turkish nationalist government in Ankara to send a joint delegation to Lausanne to renegotiate the treaty. Well, after having defeated everybody, Mustafa Kemal was not going to share the government of Turkey with the government in Istanbul that had cooperated with the Allies. Taking advantage of the situation, Mustafa Kemal explained to the delegates that the only government which represented the people and acted on their will was the Ankara government. Not wanting to hurt the religious sentiments of the deputies, he proposed to separate the Sultanate from the Caliphate and abolish the former. Heated arguments broke out. At one point, the discussions became so intense as to force Mustafa Kemal to remark, if the proposition is not accepted, some heads will be cut off. It was sufficient. The Sultanate was abolished. Ending the anomaly of two governments, Mustafa Kemal turned his eyes to the Lausanne Peace Conference, where his newly appointed foreign minister, Ismet, represented the nationalists. Acting on strict orders from Mustafa Kemal himself, Ismet made it clear to the Allies that they were dealing with a new government, which demanded equality and respect. After months of deliberation, the Turkish delegation was able to gain Turkey's complete independence in political, economic and military matters. The country's borders, with only slight modifications, were those that Mustafa Kemal had presented in 1907 and later named in the National Pact. With this breathtaking pace of diplomacy and politics, Mustafa Kemal's personal life was in considerable confusion. Leaving Fikri, who suffered from tuberculosis, behind as he led the Great Offensive, he had met and been impressed by a young woman named Latifa in Izmir. Now he was faced with a choice between the two women. But Greer cared for Kemal. She uh, made a home for him, uh, but she was not the model that he wanted for the new Turkish woman. The model was more the one presented by Latifa Hanum, who was Western educated, spoke Western languages, uh, and very strong will. Sending Fikri to Switzerland for therapy, Mustafa Kemal approached Latifa, expressed his interest, and they were married shortly afterwards. Initially, they would go around together and make trips through the country where he could show her off as the kind of woman uh, he wanted the young Turkish women to emulate. It was in Switzerland that Fikri learns about Ataturk's uh, marriage and comes back to Ankara and shoots herself. 
is a revolver that she had bought to give as a gift to Atatürk that kills herself. The death of Fikriya, uh, while it uh, must have caused him some emotional distress, he was able to put it behind him very quickly. As he was able to put most things of an unpleasant nature behind him extremely quickly. In politics, Mustafa Kemal's situation was again becoming precarious. People were expressing resentment towards the abolishment of the Sultanate, and old friends were turning into foes. Their support of the Caliph as the center of opposition left him with only one alternative. October the 29th, 1923. Attending the session of Parliament, Mustafa Kemal announced that the proclamation of the Republic would be voted upon. Explaining to the deputies that the only way out of the current dilemma was the acceptance of the Republic, he ensured the approval of his proposal. Turkey was now referred to as the Republic of Turkey, with Mustafa Kemal as its first president. He was the head of the state, as well as head of the only political party in the country. Izmet was appointed as prime minister, and Ankara was the new capital. Next on Mustafa Kemal's list was the Caliphate. He knew that for Turkey to reach the level of civilization in the rest of the world, it had to be secularized. He believed in the supremacy of human reason. He wanted Turkey to join the mainstream of human progress. And therefore, knowledge was what he was after. For many years, the offices of the Caliphate and the Ministry of Religious Affairs had prevented the entrance of knowledge into the country. They had to be removed if Turkey was to proceed forward. After careful planning, he acted on March the 3rd, 1924. And within hours, he persuaded the parliament to abolish the caliphate and end the 600-year-old Ottoman dynasty. It was extremely important because it was, after all, the severing of the link between religion and state and the legitimization of the state. He did not in any way stop the practice of religion anywhere in the country. He didn't mind what people believed, whether they went to a mosque or not, provided they did not undermine the secular state. The biggest freedom given to Turkish citizens was the law that says this is a secular state. Mustafa Kemal became the first leader to attack and defeat the forces of radical Islam. The road to civilization had been opened. Why, after my years of education, after studying the civilization and the socialization process, should I descend to the level of common people? I will make them rise to my level. Let me not resemble them. They should resemble me. He was worthy to be followed, not just uh, somebody whose commands had to be respected. He seemed to be a person to whom loyalty was unusually worth giving. With the support of the people, Mustafa Kemal was about to engage Turkey in an era of reform that was to shake centuries-old traditions. The Kemalist revolution had begun. Mustafa Kemal believed that the Turkish nation had to be modernized in their looks as well as in their minds. The religious clothes and headgear, the fez, represented traditionalism. Embarking on a tour which covered most of the conservative cities in Anatolia, he introduced the Western hat and persuaded the people to wear it as a sign of a civilized society. He also criticized the ancient traditions of seeking help and mercy from the dead and the sacred tombs. After his return, the wearing of religious garb, other than by clergymen, was banned by law. Religious brotherhoods and sacred tombs were closed down. At the end of the nine-day tour, he had removed the very foundation of society from his place. 
he was ready to replace it with a new one. Unfortunately, success at politics was accompanied by trouble at home. His relationship with Latifa deteriorated rather quickly. She was not completely in touch with the fact that Mustafa Kemal was not a man who could be run by anybody, uh, especially not by his wife. His habits were not the kind that promoted a uh, secure family life. He worked extremely hard. He worked especially late during the night. And people would come to Chankaya uh, at night, uh, and he would meet with them and discuss with them what kinds of reforms were necessary and invite their participation and their suggestions. Uh, these meetings took until 3, 4 o'clock in the morning. That kind of lifestyle was not the best lifestyle for married life and ultimately then were divorced. The marriage had lasted two and a half years. He never remarried. Mustafa Kemal's instincts were those of the harem, but his mind was a modern mind. As he wanted the emancipation of women, logically, in order to, to see the country move forward in the company of other civilized states, although in his private life he found it extremely difficult to treat women as equals. As his own marriage crumbled, Mustafa Kemal began a wave of reforms to emancipate Turkish women, who during the Ottoman times had no legal rights and were prohibited to participate in social life. Atatürk in ideal, kadınlarımızı da çağa uygun bir şekilde giyinmelerini ve yetişmelerini her sahada onların bir meslek sahibi olmalarını istiyorum. Under his strong leadership and encouragement, women became more and more involved in the daily life of the Republic. He legalized the movement by adopting the Swiss Civil Code in 1926, which prevented polygamy and gave women equal rights in marriage. With his tenacity and persistence, by 1934, 11 years before France, Turkish women had gained the right to vote and be elected into parliament. By 1935, there were 17 women deputies elected. We, the Turkish women, especially the women, we owe a great deal to Atta. We didn't fight for our rights. We were given our rights by him. Not everyone was content with the reforms. Supporters of the Caliphate felt that Kemal and the country were on the wrong path. Others, close to him, felt resentment, believing that they did not get the promotions they deserved. Building up their resentment, certain opponents planned to assassinate Mustafa Kemal when he was to visit Izmir in 1926. Thanks to an informer, the would-be assassins were arrested before they could act. Mustafa Kemal entered Izmir unharmed, but in a rage. Izmir assassination attempt was such a threat to his own sense of immortality that he had the man brought to him and identified himself to the man and said, I'm Mustafa Kemal, you want to kill me? Gave him his gun and said, go ahead. Uh, and of course the man didn't dare to do that. But Kemal had to confront this uh, attempt at his life in order to resettle his own sense of his immortality because it was such an attack uh, on that. After the trials, 13 people who had been linked to the plot were publicly hanged. All opposition to the reforms and the Republic had been silenced. With the conspirators out of the way, Kamal turned his eyes from emancipation of women to the emancipation of the mind. He knew that in a country with a literacy rate of only 8%, to establish democracy, illiteracy had to be defeated. It had to be done with a new pragmatic alphabet which was easy to learn and would enable the entrance of knowledge into the country. 
Despite the expert's complaints that five years would be needed to adopt the Latin alphabet, he ordered, it will be done in three months or not done at all. His anxiety to promote education was very personal. I guess he valued the education he had had, which elevated him from a class of ignorant people to a class of understanding and governing people. Using his charisma and persuasion, Mustafa Kemal convinced the Turkish people that learning and the teaching of a new alphabet was a national task. He toured every corner of the country with a blackboard and taught the new alphabet. The Turkish educational reform had begun with Mustafa Kemal as the head teacher. His enthusiasm was such that some of his favorite people were the, were the teachers of the country. One of his favorite visiting programs was to schools. He even went so far as to, on his own, discover students he thought showed promise, personally select them for advanced study at home or even abroad. Education was not confined to the classroom. Establishing what were termed as folk houses, Mustafa Kemal aimed to spread the reforms to the less privileged in every corner of the country. These institutions provided services ranging from dramatics to literature and history. Thanks to the folk houses and the education reforms, the Arabic alphabet had been completely abandoned and a new generation of Turks were growing up under the bright lights of freedom and knowledge. It was the announcement of a new era a new race of people who had been awakened from centuries-old ignorance. The people who have founded the Republic of Turkey are called the Turkish nation, said Mustafa Kemal, referring to his people, who for centuries had been forced to suppress their identity under the religious rule of the Ottoman Empire. By secularizing the state, Kemal knew that he needed a new, much more effective tool to maintain the unity of the Republic. Nationalism. He immersed himself in studies of history and language to find elements of Turkish heritage, which would make the people proud of their history. He founded and was personally involved in the Turkish historical and linguistic societies. Thanks to his efforts, Turks were learning about themselves and their ancestors. They were becoming more self-aware, self-confident. Mustafa Kemal said it best, Turk, be proud, be diligent, be confident. We were brought up in such, in a, such full confidence that uh, it, it is still impossible to take away from us that national identity which was given to us by that great man because he was our national identity to begin with when a law was passed stating that every turk had to adopt a surname mustafa kemal was given the surname of ataturk father turk while the work at hand was extremely serious uh, kemal also had a fun side to him. He had a great sense of humor. Uh, he always tried to make uh, the workload light for people by engaging them in uh, repartee. During Ataturk's lifetime, there was never a dull moment in Turkey. Ataturk could appear at any house, at any party, at any restaurant, uh, or any movie showing at any time without prior arrangements, without prior notice. It was this capacity to engage in both play and work uh, that enabled him to keep such long hours and enable him to focus on what he was all about. Turkey's prospects were on the rise by the early 1930s. Ataturk was finally prepared to display his creation to the rest of the world, which had been curiously eyeing this new republic. He began to receive a wave of visitors ranging from the British Prince of Wales to the King of Jordan and to General Douglas MacArthur, the chief of the American military. 
Aware of the rising threats of Nazi Italy and Germany, Ataturk predicted the Second World War during his meetings with MacArthur in 1932. He then took precautions for the impending danger by announcing his foreign policy to all his neighbors. Turkey does not desire an inch of foreign territory, but it will not give up an inch of its own. He knew that to ensure peace, old enemies had to become friends. Through his initiation and that of the Greek Prime Minister, Venizelos, a Balkan pact was signed between Turkey, Greece, Romania and Yugoslavia. Securing the country's western borders, Ataturk turned to the east, signing the Sardabad Pact with Iran, Iraq and Afghanistan. With his nomination for the Nobel Peace Prize by Venizelos, Ataturk's reputation as a peace-seeking ruler grew outside of the country. Despite his fame and the masses of people around him, Ataturk was lonely. Loving children and trying to create a regular family for himself, he had adopted eight daughters. He wanted these young women to become models uh, for the emerging Turkish youth. So he was involved in every aspect of their lives, their schooling, their choice of clothing, uh, the kinds of sports they played, the kinds of careers they would have. Uh, these were the, the lives of these young girls, his projects. Ben önce zaten bu mesleğe girdiğim zaman öyle bir eğlence gibi geldi bana. Bu şekilde böyle kabul ettim belki de. Sonra baktım Atatürk fevkalade ilgileniyor. O kadar ilgileniyor ki aa, o zaman aklım başıma geldi. Dedim ki madem ki böyle Atatürk bunu istiyor ben mahcup olmayayım ona karşı. Millete, milletime karşı da olmam. Daha ciddi bir tavır takındım. Daha ciddi çalıştım. Ve işte nihayet sonunda havacı oldum. In his later years, his youngest adopted daughter, Ulku, became the center of his attention and affection. Atatürk Ülkü'yü hiç bırakmazdı. Mesela Ülkü'ye hep sorardı, ne olmak istiyorsun diye. Ve Ülkü sanatkar olmak isterdi. Onu hep teşvik ederdi. Bak benim kızım büyüyecek, işte sanatkar olacak, ne kadar iyi olacak, gidip onu ben seyredeceğim, alkışlayacağım diye hep böyle onu teşvik ederdi. By 1936, the country was able to progress on its own. Retreating to the presidential palace, the aging Ataturk devoted most of his time to studies of history and language. Are you happy? asked a journalist. I am happy, for I have succeeded, answered Ataturk. Turkish people were working enthusiastically and with great dedication for their leader and the future. There was more revelation of what he meant to them and the way they did their work, carried on their work, were citizens of the country, than in the, their discussion of the man. The son of a customs clerk from Salonika, the special Mustafa had indeed succeeded. But after years of irregular sleeping habits and diet, strenuous work and alcohol, Ataturk's health began to fail by the beginning of 1937. Suffering from cirrhosis of the liver, he fought the only battle he was destined to lose. As the Turkish nation watched closely, Ataturk's condition deteriorated rapidly, despite the efforts of Turkish and foreign doctors. The dreaded moment came on November the 10th, 1938.
the Turkish nation has taken care of Mustafa Kemal's immortality. For Turks, he is immortal. He will live forever. And it is Mustafa Kemal's memory that they turn to for sustenance at all times. We all need another editor. I, I wish many countries in the world today had people with his capabilities and his leadership. There's always a need for editors. That may annoy some people, but I think it's true. I mean, men of outstanding capability, broad vision, and so much charisma all coming together in one individual. In the job that had to be done, nobody ever did as well as others. Although death removed him from office 60 years ago, because he was a builder for the future, Turkey of today is still the Turkey of Ataturk. <laughs>